Ladies and gentlemen, joining us today is Catherine Woodward Thomas, MA, MFT, and author of the New York Times bestselling books, Conscious Uncoupling, and the national bestseller, Calling in the One, Seven Weeks to Attract the Love of Your Life. Catherine is also a licensed marriage and family therapist and teacher to thousands from all corners of the world in her virtual and in-person learning communities. Catherine has also had the honor of being interviewed by Maria Shriver on her celebrated Architects of Change series, a main stage speaker at Lewis Howe's Live Summit of Greatness annual conference, and has been privileged to share the stage with many other extraordinary teachers. Her life-affirming and highly transformative teachings have been featured on the Today Show, as well as the New York Times, Time Magazine, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, London Times, People Magazine, Women's Health, and many other media outlets throughout the world. Catherine, welcome to the show. What a joy to be with you. I got so inspired by your, your tagline, your mission statement right up front. You know, you're, you're a man who, who's about living in integrity with the deepest truth that you have. I am so inspired by you. Thank you, Catherine. It's funny, when I was reading your book, Calling in the One, there's a chapter on your soul's purpose. And I was grateful to say, okay, that one I have in pretty good yeah, shape. Yeah, check. I've got that one down <laughs> on the mark. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us, how did you become a leader and author and inspiration in the field of relationships? I never in my wildest dreams thought I'd wind up here, Brendan, truthfully, because I was a person who struggled, seriously struggled in this area. Um, I, I grew up with a lot of relational trauma. You know, we all have our drama trauma stories. Um, you know, mine, mine was some variation of, you know, toxic divorce between my parents, super young parents getting pregnant at a time before abortion was legal. So had to have me, had to get married because that was the day. Uh, but a lot of uh, a lot of instability, a lot of um, insecurity, a lot of rejection, a lot of, you know, my mother just being chronically mad at me for existing, which, you know, as a child was somewhat confusing. Now I say that because she's, you know, she's really quite different now, but that was what we went through back then. And, um, and just the, the dramas and the traumas that we endure, sexual promiscuity in response to my parents' divorce, a lot of you know, dabbling in drugs and getting off course as a teenager. So consequently, when I was an adult, I had, you know, I had, I had some, you know, sense of direction on an educational level. I was an artist. I was a singer. I love singing, songwriting. I created a beautiful nonprofit that worked with the homeless and brought the arts down to Skid Row and kind of liberated people from their stories and stuff. So I was doing really meaningful things, but my relationships were a disaster. So kind of any size, shape, or form of impossible love, and I was just a magnet for it. So I always had some drama going on with some married guy or somebody who wasn't really broken up with his girlfriend yet, or somebody who was had this like major alcohol addiction, or they were a workaholic. I, I had this thing, and this is back, I'm talking like back in the 80s, right? So, you know, gay men who wanted to explore would get, you know, passionate about betting me. It was like, it was just insanity constantly. Yeah. And, you know, I'm laughing about it now, and it sounds like it could be, you know, another version of Sex in the City sitcom or something. But when you're living that, when you're actually going through like having hope or longing for love in the way that only someone who didn't have love when they were a child would long for love. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just in the fantasy that they're going to leave that person now for you, they're finally going to be the one that shows up for you. It's devastating. And so I lived with this chronic sense of sadness and I was constantly trying to fix myself and figure it out. And I was a spiritual practitioner uh, I, I had, uh, you know, meditation practice, a prayer practice. I was out there um, going to, you know, learning about metaphysics. I've been in therapy for years. I went to graduate school to become a therapist, which a lot of us who are therapists, you know, really started because we're still trying to figure ourselves out and fix what's wrong with us. And, um, and, and where it got me basically when I was in my early 40s is to a place where I was now setting up private practice and helping other people that have really big breakthroughs in their relationships. And I was coming home every night to my little cat Clover, you know, <laughs> <laughs> 
feeling like, okay, this is just really unfair. And, um, and as, as much as I was trying and doing all these great things, I, I think there was this low grade fever of just deep disappointment and deep sadness that I'd never been able to figure this out. I mean, I was one of those people who wanted to have a, a baby when I was 19, you know, and here I am 40, childless, never married. And, um, and, uh, and I, and I just felt really sad about it. But that's when I learned this kind of magical key. Uh, and the difference between healing your life or transforming your life. And what I learned about is that I'd been doing a lot of healing work on my childhood, but I hadn't yet figured out how to transform the story. And the key to doing that happened when I when I joined this group of friends who had been doing some transformational course with me in in Landmark because I was at Landmark too. I was in all sorts. I've had my hands in all sorts of honeypots, right? And Landmark is a great honeypot. So so we had formed this little social group where we were talking about the intentions we were setting for the future, because that's what Landmark really opens up, is living an intentional future and causing a future that isn't going to happen unless you stand for it. So I, so they were, they were like doubling their income or starting a new business. But my area that was, you know, the, the most painful for me was relationship. So I called up a friend from that group and I said, Naomi, I know this sounds really super crazy, but I'm just going to set an intention that I'm going to be engaged by my 42nd birthday. Now, I'd been trying to do that since I was like 18 to find the one to try and fix my painful childhood yeah. and to no avail. So this was like not a new project. But she said something to me that really radically changed my life. She said, Catherine, I'm going to hold that intention with you and for you. If you give me permission to hold you accountable for being the woman you would need to be in order for that to happen. And so what she did basically with that one little wise sentence was she shifted me from running out to try and make something happen to looking within and kind of identifying and releasing all of the inner barriers that I had built against love and to identifying the ways that I would need to grow in order to be ready for that to happen. So that was a radical shift of where my focus was. And that was really the beginning of calling in the one. And I started to do you know, I started to one day at a time, put one foot in front of the other, kind of doing whatever I could now to find my way to that future. So the difference between healing and transformation is that healing is about the past, but transformation is about the future that you're standing for okay. and, 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 and being willing to do whatever it takes to become the person you'd need to be to manifest and sustain that future. It would be helpful for the listeners to hear kind of what happened. So here I am, you know, kind of, you know, stumbling, a, a bull in a china shop trying to find my way to this future, not really knowing what I'm doing. But I do know enough to sit on my meditation cushion every morning. And I do know about visioning at this point. And visioning is not like, you know, you're imagining a picture and you're watching it like a movie because that's somehow separate from you. And if you think about the things that you don't have in life, and I know that there's listeners here who are here for all sorts of things that they're up to manifesting. So this is just manifestation 101, right? So all the, all the things we're trying to manifest, it, it's good to have a visual of what you look like living that future. But if you've been on the outside or it's lived like a parallel life that's painful, like you can't find your way there, it's not the most helpful way of visioning because it's still outside of you. So what you want to do when you're visioning is you bring it into your body as though it's now, right? So all of your like, what does it smell like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? What's the, what does it feel like to run my fingers through that person's hair or on their, you know, or on their, to, to touch their cheeks? What does it taste like to kiss them after they've had lemonade, right? A sip of lemonade. Like you just want to bring it into your body and you want to imagine that it's happening now. So you start to use your imagination to stretch. And then for those of us who've had a lot of woundings, like I had, you have to really stretch. Like, what does it feel like 
to have somebody that you respect and love meeting you and giving you love back, giving you respect, listening to you. What does it feel like to be where you feel safe to confront somebody on something that's inconsistent in what they're saying or to actually tell somebody what you need from them and have them listen and respond. What does that feel like in your body? So you're stretching yourself. That's what it is to vision. But the three questions that you want to ask yourself at the end of any vision, and I got these from the wonderful teacher, Michael Beckwith, who's a longtime friend of mine. Michael said he has his whole visioning process. And in the visioning process, what you do is at the end of your visioning, you say, great, thank you so much. You know, I'm, 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 I'm living into this possible future. I'm feeling into the self of who I am in this future fulfilled. But these questions that you want to ask yourself are, what would I now need to let go of in order to find my way to this future? And the moment you ask that, you, we all know, you know, I, I got to let go of, you know, emotional eating. Or I've got to let go of, you know, sleeping with my ex. Or I've got to let go of this idea that somehow I'm not good enough. We know what there is to do. And, and then the, the second question, what will I need to now grow in order to be ready to meet that date with destiny here? And, um, and, and again, we know I need to go back to the gym. I need to start to love my body. I need to start to set up structures to receive that which I'm longing for. I need to get rid of this clutter. I need to get the picture of my former lover out of my bedroom. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like there's things to do. And then you say, what is my next step? So one step at a time, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. What's my next step? What can I do today? And you listen because the, there's part of you that knows. You know, you don't have to wait for some big burning bush experience. You just know, I better, I'm going to clean out space in my closet for that person for when they come. I'm going to uh, go out and start, I'm going to buy two mugs or two sets of, uh, you know, two, two, two uh, placemats or the nightstands and the, the toothbrushes, the yeah. bathrobe for them, you know, yep. you start to create those external things. But there's also things like I need to clean that relationship up. I need to apologize or I need to really look at this thing with my mother where I keep compromising myself and giving up my power to her. I need to actually stand up to her for the first time. I need to draw a boundary. We all know, but here's the thing. What calling in the one is, is this co-creative process, right? So here I am, I'm doing this and I'm in action about it and I have courage and I'm living into that future like it's real. Do I know if that's going to happen? Of course I don't. You know, you want to build a house, you know how many bricks you need, you can pretty much lay out the blueprint. That's the make it happen system of creation. When you want to create something like love, you can't really draw that up like a blueprint. You have to just go by your intuitive knowing. You have to use these alternative ways of knowing to find your way to that possible future and start to to lean into that. And so so that becomes your your north star and how you're measuring all your choices, all your actions. So here I am doing this. And in my meditation, I get this image of the man I dated six years earlier, who I completely screwed things up with, and not only once, but twice. And, and I get this like feeling like, call Mark. It's the one thing I don't do, Brendan. Like the, all the other things I'm doing, but that's the one I resist. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'd be embarrassed to call him. I messed it up, not once, but twice with him. I can't call this guy. He's probably married with kids right now. He's just the nicest guy on the planet. And I resist it and I don't do it. Two weeks later, I go to Michael Beckwith Church and there's thousands of people. And in between service, you got thousands of people milling in the, this huge parking lot. And I look up and there's Mark. Now, I've been to this church for 10 years. I've never seen him there. But I have a shy attack. I look away. I do not go up to talk to him. And by the time I gather my courage, he's gone. Two weeks after that, I'm talking to a friend. And she says to me, you've got to get online. Now, this is over 20 years ago now, 21 years ago. 
internet dating is just starting. It's almost as creepy as the personal ads in the paper before that. It's like, oh, that's just, you know, the desperate people go and do that, right? So I'm like completely, like in my stomach, I'm completely, oh, yuck, I don't want to do that. But I'm coachable. So I do it. There's one site that I find that doesn't even exist anymore. It was called Netscape. It had a quarter of a million people on it. No technology to let people have their pictures or anything. It's all like very archaic. You know, it's like, you know, really super primitive, but they do list by city. So I'm in LA at that time. I put in LA, I put in my age, I put in that I'm a non-smoker, you know, those kind of things. So 30,000 potential matches come up because, you know, LA is like the desperate Lonely Hearts Club, you know, capital of America. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so I'm so I'm sorting through the 30,000 but the, you know with all my stats and stuff 80 potential matches come up I'm reading through them I end up responding to one completely anonymously cuz I like his profile it sounds like he's a healthy guy sounds like we're pretty aligned um, and he writes me back and then and back then if someone writes you back you know I write him this like I'm completely self-conscious, awkward, but I write him an email and I tell him a little bit about myself. He writes me back and it goes directly into my inbox. And at that point, you know, his name is in parentheses next to his email address because that's how we did it back then. And I see that it's Mark. <laughs> <laughs> And so we we were engaged two months ahead of deadline, you know, and and ha I and I gave birth to our daughter when I turned before I like in my before I turned forty four, mm -hmm. I and uh, so that and that's when I decided to write calling in the one. I'm like, oh my god, this cannot be a personal miracle. Like, what did I just do that created this? So I started to, you know, write it all down got my first book deal in a pretty magical way because the whole energy of calling in the one is kind of, it's it's in its own vortex of magic. Yeah. Um, I will tell you this little, this little addition to the story because, you know, life moves on. What happens after Happily Ever After? So we, you know, so the book goes out. I become this teacher to thousands of people. It launches my career. But this time I am a licensed psychotherapist. It's like, you know, we're living this kind of blessed life. But, you know, I, I think that truthfully, my career took me in a particular direction, the stresses of parenthood, whatever. We ended up getting unmarried after a decade, mm -hmm. which was a big shock because we all think, you know, you find the one and it's forever. And we all have these assumptions that the one will be forever. And if it isn't forever, then it somehow was a mistake or a compromise or it was, you know, not the right thing. But it was the right thing. And it was a blessing. So how do I make sense of that? I, you know, so anyway, that was the birth of conscious uncoupling because the saving grace of that parting of the ways, that getting unmarried process was how well and elegantly and beautifully we did it. And then, of course, Gwyneth came along and popped that book into the lexicon. That became a big, you know, a big shift in culture. So that was a blessing. Yeah. People uh, say- you're referring, Just for the listeners that you're referring to Gwyneth Paltrow- said conscious uncoupling helped her and so it made you yeah, she used of, my term to announce yeah. her divorce on goop yeah and that went in that became international news when you uh remarried did you do the calling in the one process i did <laughs> and then i decided to do it again but here's the thing about that brendan i think when we all go to create something you know as beautiful as love it's kind of like hitting the jackpot. You know, you, you win the lottery of love. We all doubt ourselves. Is that even possible? And we all have reasons why it couldn't really happen for us, or maybe it won't happen. We all hope it will. And I'm just making that transparent because I had those feelings too. You know, the second time around, gosh, I'm in my 60s now. Could this happen twice for me? <clears throat> and I have that. Now I have the added complexity of when I go out on dates, they're like, Oh, you wrote the one, and then having the insult of, of of having a couple of people I dated saying, "Well, I'm not the one," you know, because I'm known as the queen of the one. So the pressure that that puts right. on people. Right. I hear this from my friends who are relationship experts. It's it's a thing for thought leaders, you know, mm. and any of us. So it's it's important to stay humble and honest and open, and you know, none of us are perfect human beings, and we're all finding our way. But I do know that calling in the one works. So even though I had those doubts, 
I did do calling in the one again. I said, okay, well, let me go back and do this process again. And in a very magical way, I met my now beautiful partner, Michael. And, um, and we have the most delicious relationship that's kind of now informed by all that I learned when I self-reflected so deeply after my breakup with Mark and took responsibility for what I could have done better in that relationship. And I'd imagine that having gone through the first, the, the first time around, like I remember in Calling in the One, there was some scene where you guys were going to the jewelry store and it was too hard for you emotionally, which I totally understand to go in and like let him well, love you, right? And so I'm, my point is having gone through the process and done all that development transformation, I'm guessing the second time around wasn't as intensely rigorous internally for you. No, it wasn't because that first time when I couldn't go into the jewelry stores because I was so somatically anchored into I'm not valuable yeah. that I got really confronted with how much engagement rings cost. And that idea is one of the things we really look at, like this core, what I call love identity. Mm -hmm. And that for me formed in response to um, when I was 10, there was an incident where my dad owed my mother child support. He owed her about $5,000, which is interesting because that's about the price that we were looking at engagement rings. This is why this was so emotional. Yeah. And he didn't want to pay that to her. And she got remarried and she wanted her, her, her uh, next husband to, which was actually her third husband, but she wanted her third husband to adopt me. Mm. And uh, to, my father gave up parental rights. And what she did is she threatened to sue him for $5,000. So in my little 10-year-old mind, he sold me for $5,000. Right, right, <laughs> right. So, so I had internalized that into I'm not very valuable. You right. know, you could just sell me for $5,000. And uh, so when we were looking at engagement rings and they cost $5,000, it was freaking me out. So, you know, I had to come to terms with, yeah, I am valuable. And the, and the meaning that I made when I was 10 was not accurate meaning. Yeah. That was a 10-year-old's thinking and what I made that mean about me. If you talk to my dad, which I've done a lot because we've repaired our relationship, my, my biological father and I are actually quite close now. You know, it had nothing really. I mean, the, the five thousand dollars was a stressor, but it there were a lot of complex decisions, and mainly he made that decision because he thought it was best for me because my mother hated him so much, and he didn't want me growing up in that realm of hatred. He wanted me to grow up in love, mm -hmm. so that was his best thinking at the time. You know, the meaning that we make about things is completely off the mark. It's very, you know, children don't think of things with a lot of complexity. It's just, you know, pretty black and white. And yeah. it's very egocentric. It must be that I'm not valuable. Yes. Right. It so that shame that I'm not good enough. And then we chase all the wrong partners romantically. Yeah. We, with the I'm not good enough, you're either going to, you know, go after narcissists who are overly confident and think that they're like the best thing on the planet. And then you're going to kind of try and get your self-esteem from being connected to them, which yep. of course the relational dynamic is just designed to constantly reinforce that, you know, you aren't good enough because your feelings, guess what? Do not matter at all here. <laughs> and what you need is not important. Right. And, uh, or you're going to go with people who are kind of you know, beneath you on the hierarchy of who's good enough and who's not good enough. So then you're going to be constantly, you know, superior to that person, but unfulfilled because that person can't really meet you or care for you. So you're either the victim of it or the perpetrator of the story. So we get captivated by these narratives. And what I, what I discovered calling in the one is about is how do you create something that's outside of that narrative entirely? It's yeah. not a, it's not a fix of that narrative. It's not uh, an expression of that narrative. It's not inside what Freud called the repetition compulsion at all. It's just a whole new story that's more aligned with your soul, that's yeah. more true to who you actually are and who you came here to be. Yeah. So there's a whole section. So the first three steps of, ca of calling in the one are all about identifying what I call these inner obstacles to love. And that core love identity is the, the biggest one. So some, some of the main ones are I'm alone. And the narrative of, you know, in I'm alone is I'm alone. No one is ever there for me. Or everyone always leaves. 
Um, and then the, the belief about life is I can just never get my needs met. So expectations to ever get your needs met are very low. So consequently, you'll do things like get involved with, you know, people who predictably aren't going to be able to be there for you. You don't assess whether someone's available. Somehow that's just off your radar. So you do choose people who can't really be there or predictably will end up leaving you. So there's all sorts of ways that we're kind of the authors of the story. Feels like it's happening to us. Mm-hmm. And what we want to see clearly is, wait a minute, how is it happening through you? Because the, the sense of resignation that most of us have in this area who've struggled or any area that you've struggled in your life, the resignation comes from all the evidence you've gathered to the contrary mm-hmm. or your over-identification with that story. Because inside of over-identifying with that story, you can really only show up in ways that are designed to perpetrate the story in some way. Yeah. Th- those are kind of, yeah, it's just how it's rigged in human consciousness. So we have to go deeper than the story and the identity that people have kind of grown themselves around or in reaction to mm-hmm. and and actually go down almost to the level of soul. So for some of us, uh, you know, I love, I love Mark Wolin's book, which is about inherited family trauma. Mm-hmm. And that book is called It Didn't Start With You. So some of us are born into the I'm not good enough tribe. Yep. The cycle of hey, my mom <laughs> was like this and then her mom was like this. Right. Or the I'm invisible tribe. Yep. Yeah. Or the I'm not safe tribe. That's a really big one. Abuse running in the family. So I'm yeah. not safe. So I've got all sorts of defenses up. I put walls up. And yeah. the moment I let go of my walls, then of course I'm victimized by someone because I actually have no boundaries. Right. I have no idea what a boundary is. No idea, you know, how to protect myself in a healthy way. So then the wall has to come up again. And maybe I spend years alone inside of that story. So these stories, these kind of ideas that we have about who we are and what's possible for us, they actually become kind of the, the driving force of creativity because we're, we're generating our lives from where we're centered at the level of identity. So um, it's very important that we really, you know, that, I mean, that, that, that question that my friend Naomi asked me, you know, about becoming, you know, who would you need to be? So you mentioned that earlier, how important it is to stop sleeping with an ex or throw out the pictures and cutting the toxic ties. And why do you think that's so important to be able to then call in the one? Well, so here's the thing. So chapter two, which is all these lessons on letting go of the past, yeah. completing with the past. Mm-hmm. Um you know, the truth is, is that we're all so creative. Even those of us who don't think we're creative, we're actually co-creating our lives in partnership with the energies of life and that there's a myriad of possibilities present. A lot of us relate to the future as though it's kind of fixed in some way. And um, and we have to really begin to, to recognize that the future is really fluid and it's open to who you're being and your input, the actions you take, the choices you make. So this particular lesson about letting go of toxic ties, identifying toxic ties is really looking at where are you habitually giving your power away to other people? Where are you dimming down? Where are you pretending to be less than who you are in order to stay bonded? with someone in order to keep the peace with someone. Because basically what I'm saying is, is if you are in this habitual kind of dynamic with someone where you're giving your power away for you to be visioning a partner who's the highest and the best for you, who's really coming in and you're co-creating your lives at the, the level of, you know, actualizing the highest potentials that you have and catalyzing uh, not just healing for each other, but profound levels of success, profound levels of self-expression, like really kind of reaching the pinnacle of of the possibility of who you are. You've got to be in command of all your power and to have the illusion that you can still keep being codependent with your, you know, older alcoholic brother who's super abusive to you and yet you're supporting him and he's not helping himself, but you're helping him or you're sleeping with someone who's still treating you like crap and not, you know, acknowledging 
that you have feelings and needs, not giving you the respect that you deserve, you know, all of these kind of strands of where you're putting your energy. Um, You're not in the command of your full power. You're not going to be able to manifest the highest and the best possible partnership. So we think we can compartmentalize that, but we can't. And, um, And so what I'm saying is basically, you don't want to just get rid of that person, you know, because you know, look, if you have a relationship with a toxic person, it's because on some level, you know, you care about them, you love them, uh, you want the best for them. Maybe it's an old friend. Uh, maybe it's a relative. Maybe it's your boss. So you kind of depend on that person. You you love your job, but you, you know, you're in this toxic dynamic. They're kind of narcissistic. They speak down towards you, all this kind of stuff. They step over your boundaries. So what you need to do actually is take responsibility for having gotten into that dynamic and all the ways you give your power away, all the ways you withhold truth, all the ways you don't stand up for yourself. And actually, rather than blaming the other person, and probably the other person behaves badly chronically, so it's super easy to get, you know, to, 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 to put your focus there. But you really want to look at your own part of that. And you want to clean that up. You want to actually go to them and say, look, uh, you know, I, I've been kind of pretending that this is okay with me that you come to me, you know, five five minutes to five and say, I need you to work an extra two hours. This is now happening uh, in the hopes that, you know, you would see my value and you would give me a raise. I know that that's a very, you know, inauthentic way to <laughs> want to be valued by you. The truth is I don't have that to give. And so if you need me to work extra, you need to tell me the day before so I can make childcare arrangements or, you know, you have to just tell people the truth. You tell people the truth, you set a boundary with them and you let the chips fall where they may because your fidelity is now to the future you're standing for. You recognize I need to be a healthier person. You know, it's part of that question. Who will I need to be? How will I need to grow in order to meet that date with destiny? Well, I need to be a, a, someone who can actually set boundaries. Yeah. Somebody who can, you know, show self-respect in how I'm dealing with things. Maybe I shouldn't be in this job. Maybe I should get another job. You know, you know, you have to be willing to disappoint other people, to lose what you think you're, you know, salvaging by giving yourself away and throwing yourself under the bus. So integrity first and foremost, and fidelity to that future, to building that relationship. So already you're actively engaged in becoming the healthiest version of yourself now everywhere with everyone. And very often what we find is when we have the courage to retrain people who are quote unquote toxic, that they actually get better. I am coming out with another version of calling in the one. And those are the things I wanted to change. That's why I rewrote the book. Uh, Okay. So is that, because I know that I have my next question is talk about your new book. So is that. So that's one of the things is I just made it more contemporary because I wrote the book in 2002 and, you know, you know, John's book, Mars and Venus was kind of the big, big, big book back then, even though he's right. a huge, wonderful, best-selling author still. He's a, actually a friend of mine. He's a wonderful man, but, and his distinctions are great. But I think that we're also entertaining this, you know, looking at our own biases and our own assumptions. And in particular, I've seen a big rise in men in this last year of, of being at home yeah. really going within and really doing this internal work in consciousness yep. as a viable form of how do I manifest a powerful life mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and lining up. So, so I do, uh, I am thrilled that the new book is coming out and is more, <laughs> more um, respectful of uh, kind of not being so gender specific So um, anyway, I just love the modeling that you're giving on what it looks like to be a powerful man who can cause, you know, magic and miracles to happen really by being connected to your authenticity and your truth and being willing to be vulnerable in that way. That's pretty rock star in my world. Thank you, Catherine. I think of Alanis' song. What did she write? She wrote that beautiful song Alanis Morris said about, you know, the conscious man. She wrote that a couple of decades ago. She's a woman ahead of her time for sure. But mm-hmm. you reminded me of that song. I actually had the pl- that playing in my head as you're talking. So I just want to honor you in that way. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was also going to say, and maybe this could be our last question as we kind of close out here. 
as I was reading it again with the completions and the toxic ties, I was hiding behind not only relationships where I could feel in control and not be challenged to be totally vulnerable, but also with some people and friendships. And it also really kind of forced me to be more vulnerable and, you know, move on from and set better boundaries with friendships that were also holding me back. Wow. So let me ask you um, how the relationship you're having now with this woman that you're dating differs from how relationships have been for you in the past. I've mostly found myself in relationships with women who uh, weren't in a good place, either in their career or emotionally, not really totally available and not in, yeah, not in an emotional and spiritually centered place to really be ready for marriage and also be willing to confront inevitable relational conflicts with a desire to repair them and be open about them. Mm -hmm. Before the past few years, I was in a serious relationship again with a woman who was not in a very good place, not really ready for a relationship. And it was very much me sort of feeling like I'm prying my way into her life to get her to give me what I wanted. So was that kind of like a rescue? You know, I'm going to come to the rescue. I think so many men. Yeah fall into, you know, being the prince who comes and rescues the the poor pauper Cinderella. You know, we're all like so influenced by these archetypes that we just have, see over and over and over. Yeah. And it's so unsatisfying. Yeah. It's such a different relationship to have someone who is, you know, an equal. You know, there's a wonderful teacher, uh, Polly Young Eisendrath. She's kind of a teacher's teacher. She wrote a wonderful book called Love Between Equals. And what she really points out in that book, and, and she, yeah, I've been talking about similar ideas for a while, but she really lays it out beautifully, is that we are in such a major cultural transformation where we're going from kind of hierarchical models of relationship into love between equals. And the hunger that we have for soulmate love, for true connection, to be with someone who's our best friend and our, you know, really exciting sexual partner and our really deep, soulful, spiritual partner, all of these things that we long for is really to be met at the highest level, to have someone who's inspiring us to be the best that we can be, to help us to grow as we're helping them to grow. So it's a really different way. It's a really different archetype. And um, I'm just so touched and and moved to to meet you and have this conversation with you and see you modeling this so beautifully for men. Well, thank you for doing what you do because I so went on Amazon first and saw your book reviews for Calling in the One. And I don't know if you know this, but they're all five stars pretty much. And they say, it worked. I found my one. And uh, so it's pretty amazing. And what I really love about the book is not only does it have all the information we need to understand about our patterns, but every lesson has an actionable exercise. And if you do it and you write it out, and I remember I was on like lesson 45, I was like, ah, I guess it's not going to work for me. But what I told myself in the moment was if I don't meet her by lesson 49, I'm going to start again at the top. And I don't know if you recommend doing that, but that was going to be my plan. I love that I'm plan. Start again from Yeah, here. I think that's great. I mean, when I wrote the book initially, I was modeling it after, um, I was modeling it after texts that were books that meant so much to me because I could read them over and over and over mm -hmm. and I could feel the energy of comfort and wisdom coming from them. So that was what I was aspiring to mm -hmm. at the time. And, and, and I think that that's wise because it's hard to keep holding possibility when you have evidence to the contrary, when you're, you know, coming home to an empty apartment and, you're, you're wanting that and you have all these, you know, there's all this history to the contrary. So I do want to say to, to that, that many people do not call in the one in seven weeks, like you just sure. did. Right. It's not necessarily a promise of the book. The, prom the promise of the book is that you're going to be in the consciousness 
of now being able to kind of be unstoppable to make this happen yeah. and to move your life in that new direction of creating outside the old story. But I love it when I hear people do, and that's really adorable on day 49, the last day of the program. <laughs> there you go. So um, yeah, let's sort of wrap up here. Tell us more about the new book and the new book comes out on May 11th. So the old book is still great. You can hear how much, you know, you were able to gain from it, but just, you know, forgive the archaic uh, gender biases. And I also found that it was very kind of, you know, I'm Caucasian. All the names were Mary, Sue, John, Bill. So I have to go back yeah. and say, you know, <laughs> the book has gone international and you know, it, it's really for anyone and also, you know, more gay couples and more variations on a theme. So, uh, so just really um, updating that, but there's also a way that I've worked with now 60,000 people taking them through the process. And that's not just, you know, I've done a podcast and had 60,000 download kind of thing. I've actually worked with 60,000 people. I've trained thousands of coaches. So I, I have, you know, learned a thing or two about the process. So I, I streamlined it a bit too, trying to keep, you know, the full integrity of the, the book as it is now um, with what I also see fast track. So you, so for those of you who can wait a little bit, you might want to pre-order the new book. Um, if you want to start right away, just get the, the book as it is now. But I also have, um, I have a book study that's coming up that's celebrating that that starts on the 28th of April. I don't know if you know when when you're posting the podcast and getting it out there. But anyone who wants to know about these things can just go to my website calling in the one.com or Catherine Woodward Thomas.com. Calling in the one.com, Catherine Woodward Thomas.com. And um, I'm trying to think what else I was going to ask you. You talk about doing the book in a group or having a partner. Do you recommend yeah, that? Yeah, I definitely do because I do think that it's easy for us to get discouraged in this area. Yeah. So I definitely, and it's one of the reasons I started to teach people. And then I found out how wonderful uh, a way, it, uh, how, how, how much our sense of possibility is is enhanced by being with each other, hearing each other's stories, learning from each other, taking a stand with and for each other. And if you think about it, it's where the roots of calling in the one are is in this group. I didn't do that alone initially either. So I had my vision keepers in the group. So when I would get discouraged, they would hold me accountable. Who would you need to be? You know, how can you respond <laughs> to the situation? Are you dating no. that person really? Because that's not really what it looks like for you to be calling in your partner. So it's it's good to have people that we're accountable to, not who are judging us in any way, but who love us enough to really be holding the high watch with and for us and they for them. Beautiful. <laughs> so <laughs> and I actually, you. in the book, in the book, I tell people how to get a group of friends together to do it together. Yeah. There's actually instructions for that too. So yeah. 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 Thank you. Catherine Woodward Thomas. Thank you again so much for coming on the show. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure.